Good morning, and welcome to St. Bartholomew's Anglican Church's live stream service on this Wednesday. This is Holy Week, the most sacred week of the church year, and I'm so delighted that you have taken the time to join us as we worship the Lord, as we honor Him uh, during this most uh, sacred time. Well, we are doing the service of morning prayer from the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, and if you have your Anglican Book of Common Prayer with you, I'd invite you to turn to page 11. And although on page 11 we have a number of opening scriptures, uh, we will use the scripture from Matthew 3, 2 on page 27. You don't have to turn there, but on page 27 we have the uh, choices for this Lenten season. I'm Father Ward, by the way, and this is my assisting priest, uh, our curate for St. Bartholomew's Father Andrew uh, Tebow. Let us now begin the worship of our great God and Savior. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Dearly beloved, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our heavenly Father, but confessing them humbly and with obedient hearts, that we may obtain forgiveness uh, by his infinite goodness and mercy. We at all, at all times humbly our we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before almighty god but especially when we come together in his presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at his hands to declare his most worthy praise to hear his holy word and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. Let us now pray the uh, prayer of confession. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent, according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Continuing now on page 14. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. O come, let us adore Him. Let us now say together the Vanity. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the depths of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my works." Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, 
It is a people that err in their hearts, but they have not known my ways, of whom I swore in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. O come, let us adore him. We now will hear the readings appointed for this day, and we'll be using the readings appointed for Wednesday and Holy Week. Good morning. Our appointed psalm this morning is Psalm 69, which you can find on page 354 of your prayer books. That's page 354, Psalm 69. We will read in unison uh, verses 6 through 14 and 21 through 22. That's 6 through 14 and 21 through 22. Together in unison. Let not those who trust in you, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded through me, O God of Israel. Surely for your sake I have suffered reproach. Shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brethren, unknown to my mother's children. Because zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproached you have fallen upon me. I wept and humbled myself with fasting, but that was turned to my reproach. I put on sackcloth also, and I became a byword among them. Those who sit in the gate speak against me, and the drunkards make songs about me. But Lord, I make my prayer to you in an acceptable time. Hear me, O God, in the multitude of your mercy, even in the truth of your salvation. Reproach has broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. I looked for some to have pity on me, but there was no one. Neither have I found any to comfort me. They gave me gall to eat, and when I was thirsty, they gave me vinegar to drink. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 50, verses 4 through 9. That's Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 9. The Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples, that I may know how to sustain the weary one with the word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out my beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting, for the Lord God helps me. Therefore I am not disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up to each other. Who has a case against me? Let him draw near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who is he who condemns me? Behold, they will all wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from the epistle to the Hebrews, beginning in chapter 9. That is uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 28. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, He entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ 
who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this reason, He is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promises of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead. For it is never in force while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And according to the law, one may almost say, All things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. Therefore it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place with, made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it with that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await Him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Gospel reading today is taken from the Gospel of Matthew. I'll be reading from chapter 26, verses 1 through 5, and then 14 through 25. What we're going to do from now on, uh, per a suggestion of one of our listeners on Sunday, is give you a little bit of time to uh, look up the passage before uh, we read it. So as you're turning to Matthew chapter 26, for those who'd like to uh, follow along in their scriptures, I'll be reading again from verses 1 through 5 and then 14 through 25. That's Matthew chapter 26. And the context here is the night before Jesus is to be crucified. He's with his uh, disciples, actually the day, and there's a plot already of conspiracy to kill Jesus. And we know who helps uh, the leaders accomplish this plot and accomplish their uh, nefarious plans, and that would be Judas Iscariot. Reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas. And they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise a riot might occur among the people. Then one of the twelve, named Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out thirty pieces of silver to him. From then, from then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciple came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And Jesus said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I am to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. 
So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Now when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve disciples. As they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. And he answered, He who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. And Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Please pray with me. And now, Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be ever pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Hag Sameach. That is a happy holiday uh, in Hebrew. Uh, Today is the Feast of Passover, uh, which seems uh, fitting to me that today it would land on today, as today is, uh, in the course of Holy Week, the beginning of our remembrance of Jesus' celebration of the Passover with his disciples, uh, which we heard Father Ward read uh, just a moment ago. So I invite you quickly uh, to turn to Matthew 26, uh, which is where our gospel reading came from today. You're probably already there. Uh, What I want to do is play a little bit of connect the dots today. Uh, The temptation was to go uh, through all the readings and do that, but we just don't have time. Uh, So we're going to connect one uh, significant dot um, that I would like us to meditate on today and tomorrow. Uh, Tomorrow is Maundy Thursday, uh, which is when we remember uh, the institution of the Lord's Supper and uh, Jesus' washing of the, d- the disciples' feet. And so we'll get that part of the reading tomorrow. But today we get the preparation for the feast. And we have here in verse 2, Jesus says, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man is to be handed over for the crucifixion. So right there, Jesus is already connecting the dot between the feast of Passover and the cross. His death, specifically, on the cross. So let's take a moment and think about what is going on in Passover, the Feast of Passover. Why is this such a significant feast for our elder brother, the Jews? Well, in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, uh, Moses has an encounter with God, and God commissions him and sends him on a mission to release, to get his people out of Egypt. Uh, And this requires their being set free from bondage to slavery. So if you recall, Moses and the Pharaoh get into something of a battle, uh, and the Lord backs up Moses with ten plagues, uh, the most severe plague being the plague of the death of the firstborn, right? Uh, And so the Spirit of God descends upon the people of Egypt and strikes dead all the firstborns in the land, both human and animal. But he saves his people. He tells the Jewish people to slaughter a lamb, uh, a lamb without blemish, and to take the blood of that lamb and to paint it on the doorposts. And that they were to eat that lamb and to eat unleavened bread uh, so that they would be ready to go after the Lord uh, strikes Egypt. And what we're told is that as the Spirit comes through the camp, the Spirit sees the blood of the Lamb on the doorpost and passes over those houses, hence Passover. So the firstborn in those houses was passed over, was not killed. They were spared by the blood of the Lamb. And so the people that were meant to be taken out of Egypt were marked and signed by this blood on the doorposts. 
And then after the calamity falls upon the Egyptians, it's at that point that the Israelites, uh, well, the Hebrews who become the Israelites, are then set free from their bondage. And so the Christian tradition has understood the Passover as being one of the primary ways that we can understand Jesus' work on the cross. So on the cross, our Hebrews reading tells us, we are saved by Jesus' blood. And if you recall, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry in the book of John, John the Baptist identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And this lamb dies upon the cross. And it's by his blood that we are saved. We are set free from the bondage of slavery to sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. So in the same way that the the people of Israel, the Hebrews, are set free from the curse that comes upon the Egyptians by blood, and they are ultimately set free from their own bondage to slavery, so too are we set free and passed over from death from the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we have here Jesus then making that same connection for us. Now, this seems all the more significant given our our own context today. So let's think about two things quickly. I want to think about... uh, Well, let me say this first. Passover becomes the chief identity marker for the Jewish people. Even today, Passover and the Day of Atonement are the two primary feasts for them. However, because they don't have the temple, they don't celebrate the Day of Atonement the same way as they would like. But Passover especially becomes their identity marker. That's the event where they are set free from Egypt. And God buys them as his own. And so in Deuteronomy 6, 4, with the, um, the Shema, Israel is commanded to remember that event, to remember that uh, setting free, that they were made God's people in that event, and they're to remember that every day. And that's to give their life's shape. They are to be a people marked by that. They are the people of God who were set free by God. And that has significance for who they are as well as how they are to live. So too for us in our Passover, which happens on the cross. That is how we are to be marked. We are the people bought with the blood of Christ. We are no longer our own. And that has significance for our identity, but also for the way that we are to live our lives. We are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. And we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. We are called to die to self, to pick up our cross and to die to self in order to follow Jesus Christ. Now that's important for us. Here's why. Two reasons. If we are the people bought by Christ, if we are the people that belong to God, there are promises that go with that. And we can trust those promises. We can trust that God will be with us through suffering. We can trust that He is coming to make all things new again because He's already done it. And we can look back in our history and we can remember and see that He is faithful to do what He has said He will do. And because of that, we can trust that the things He's promised to do and has not yet done, He will do. We can trust that He will be with us even through this storm of COVID-19. That even in our suffering, He will be here with us. And we can trust that because He's promised that He will do it. And we have seen that He keeps His promises. He is a faithful and just God. It's also significant for us because we are a people shaped by this event. So in our reading today, We see Judas. And the temptation for us is to keep Judas away. To say, oh man, that Judas, he's so bad. Thank God I am not like Judas. But in reality, we are like Judas. Because we don't live into the responsibilities that we have. We set up false idols. We turn to other things instead of the God who saved us on the cross. And in this most sacred time of Holy Week, We are invited to remember the things that God has done for us, but we are also invited to repent. To 
think on and meditate in all the ways that we fall short in our lives and to repent of those things. Trusting in God's goodness because we are also remembering what He has done for us. So we don't repent as those who don't have hope. We have hope. And because of that hope, we can come before the Lord and ask for His forgiveness, trusting that He will forgive our sins. So I encourage you in these next, as we go through the rest of Holy Week, think on these things. Repent. Turn to the Lord with hope. To the glory of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father Thibault, for that reminder that we are servants of the God who's most high, but also we are followers of the God of hope. Let us uh, now continue our worship of the Lord by saying together the Benedictus, the song of Zechariah, the uh, song of praise that Zechariah said to the Lord after he recognized Mary's baby as Jesus the Messiah from Luke's Gospel. The bottom of page 19, let us say this together. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from all our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Let us say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show us your mercy upon us. And grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide those who govern us. And lead us in the way of justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. And let your people sing with joy. O Lord, save your people. And bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord. And defend us by your mighty power. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And take not your Holy Spirit from us. I invite you to pray the collect appointed for this Wednesday, a collect for grace, which you can find on page 23. Together, O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, You have brought us safely to the beginning of this day. Defend us by Your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor run into any danger, and that guided by Your Spirit, we may do what is righteous in Your sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Continuing on page 24 at the bottom, together let us pray the third collect for mission. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. 
So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you. For the honor of your name. Amen. I invite you now to uh, turn to page 26 as we conclude with the prayer of St. John Chrysostom. I do want to make a, a point of correction. The uh, Benedictus is Zacharias's song of praise on behalf of the birth of John the Baptist, not Jesus. Uh, and so um, Zacharias uh, is giving thanks for the birth of John the Baptist. And uh, it is appropriate that we uh, say that together during this Lenten season especially, as it is appointed for morning prayer. It doesn't have to be said at every morning prayer service, but we choose it uh, because it's a reminder of not only the message of repentance, which is central to the Lenten season, but also to the role that John the Baptist played in um, God's salvation history. Let us now pray the prayer at the top of page 26. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, grinding us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to just close with two points. What I just read to you is taken from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and it's a wonderful rem- reminder that God is doing in us things that we can't even imagine. And that there's so much good in the future. We need to hold on to those good promises because God is going to work everything together for good no matter what we're going through. And the second thing I want to add is just a reminder that at 1030 and 27 minutes, come back, uh, join us as we will have a Q&A with our clergy. And I want you to be thinking of questions to ask us, not just questions about how we're doing or how the church is doing or what's the future hold for the church. You can ask those questions, certainly, uh, or questions concerning the COVID-19 virus. Why, why do we have toil- a toilet paper sh- uh, shortage? You can ask that question because it's not actually because people are simply hoarding toilet paper. But actually, more importantly, if you have any theological or biblical questions, now's an opportunity. We have the time. Uh, now's the opportunity to ask us. So uh, feel free to type those in, to send those in via Facebook, and we'll be back with you in about 25 minutes. Thank you. God bless, and uh, we'll see you soon.